We started from the hamlet of White Creek and drove north on Niles Road, took a left onto Lincoln Hill Road, and now are turning right onto Notch Lane and following it north to the State Forest. don't have a vehicle with high clearance, you would be wise to park in the plow turn around here and walk from this point. In muddy conditions you will need four wheel drive beyond this point. Lucy is enjoying the ride in. We are almost at the trailhead, and I have to turn the Dodge around and park it. There is a small parking spot up ahead across from the trail.
long ago someone stacked rocks here and made a fort. On the downhill side of the trail in this section there are ovals of stones that might have once been potash or pearl ash works. There have also been a lot of blowdowns here in recent years. Here we come to a fork in the trail. Keeping left will take you up the mountain to a lookout where you can see from your main hill farm in the valley below into Vermont and maybe Massachusetts. It is a steep climb but worth it for the view. The lookout is on private property, so if you do go up there, please respect and care for it and keep it open for others. Today we are going right, on the trail where Lucy and I are returning for the camera. Keeping right and taking the trail down the mountain will take you to the kiln. Off to the left as you go down the mountain you will see a few big sinkholes. Obviously there is a cave system under this area. They are not recent, though. A stone wall probably built in the 1830s runs right through one. We are now approaching the lime kiln which you will soon see on your right hand as we continue walking down through here. We are now at the kiln. You can see it as we come down the trail, as it is close on the right hand side. Lucy standing next to it by the tree will give you an idea of the scale of it. On the south side of the kiln where I am walking to, there used to be an arched doorway with a passage under the burning chamber. It was used to control the airflow to keep the kiln at the right temperature, and also the way to remove the finished product, called quicklime, when the burn was finished. Attached here is a still photo of a still standing kiln showing the arch and passageway. Unfortunately, this one is totally collapsed. The kiln was built against this ledge so that it could be loaded from the top easily. They laid alternate layers of wood and lime into the burning chamber. I'll show you a quick video of the burning chamber next, or what little you can still see of it. Here we are looking down at the top of the kiln. If I move the leaves and brush aside you can just make out the wall of the chamber down there. It doesn't show up well, but here is a still photo from a few years ago. The chamber was about 10 feet in diameter and shaped like an egg cup, with an iron grate at the bottom. Just southwest of the kiln is the spring. Water was essential to the lime operation. It was used to slake the quick lime produced by the kiln. Water comes out from under the ledge the kiln is built against, probably through the cave system I pointed out earlier. From the spring the water runs down to the mill pond. Now I am standing behind the spring and will be walking across the spring and west up the far slope to the slaking pit.
This is the slaking pit. The quicklime was raked out from under the kiln, brought over here, spread out in this pit, and carefully watered down with just the right amount of water. I'll run my hiking staff around the edges. It then got very hot. Before electricity they used to drip water on quicklime and lamps in theaters for spotlights. That is where the expression wanting to be in the limelight came from. Quicklime was dangerous, you did not want to get it in your eyes or on your damp skin. Once the slaking was completed it was safe to handle. The pile of stones at the southwest end might indicate a fireplace to warm the kiln watcher, or perhaps a forge. There looks to have been another small shed behind the pit, with a pile of rocks and ash in it, with a couple of pieces of very old brick, the only brick I have found on site. When the light is right I think I've made out faint traces of a skidway that I think went around and down to the mill. From the spring we'll follow the brook along the wall for about 400 feet down to the mill pond. This is the mill pond's upper end. Here I am where the brook runs in from the spring. The brush is so thick that I am going to insert still shots from March of 2016, in black and white, when the recently melted snow had packed down the leaves and brush. This makes it much easier to see the contours of the ground and what is there. That is the best time to go exploring historical or archaeological sites like this. Go after the snow goes off but before things start to green up. In the previous two photos, you could see the left bank of the mill pond in the first photo, and just the foot of the right bank in the second. In this staring clip I am going to wade through the jungle down the right hand bank, across the dam, and back on the left hand bank to show you the size of the original pond. If you ignore Lucy's antics and watch closely you will see me moving through the brush now and then. Of course, the pond silted in and was originally deeper than it is now. The dam crossed a natural ravine, which helped create the pond, but most of the pond would have been dug out by hand or by scoops pulled behind oxen or mules. The dirt was piled along the edges and shaped to make the banks. This clip shows the dam. It is followed by a still of both upper and lower dams. The upper dam shows through the trees in the upper left hand corner. The second still shows the remaining standing section of the upper dam. The third still shows the washed away portion of the upper dam. The penstock was in this section. The upper dam sits on the lower dam, but 20 feet back from its face, and rises 4 feet higher meaning there was four feet of usable water in the pond when it was full. The wooden penstock ran through the upper dam, over the lower, and dumped the water onto the wheel. It also allowed the water to be turned on and off, and filtered out debris. This is the wheel pit and tail race. The wheel sat in here and after the water dumped out of the wheel the tail race channeled it away. The trip hammer mill was just to the right. Next to the tail race was the spillway. When the pond got full the water ran over a slightly lower section of the upper dam and down the spillway, being channeled away from the mill in the dam. This is the foundation of the trip hammer mill as it looks in 2021.
I couldn't find a decent free illustration of an old trip hammer, so I had to draw one myself. Please excuse my lack of artistic skills. Here is a link to a four-ton one at the Shaker Museum in Chatham you can look at also. This still shot is looking down from the dam on the spillway, tail race, and mill foundation, from right to left. It is followed by a shot of the trip hammer mill foundation. Up at Shays Settlement there is a similar foundation with a large pile of rocks where the forge was. There is no such pile here, so we can conclude there was no forge, and that the trip hammer was not used to work metal, but to break up rock for the kiln, and to pound lumps out of the lime. Going back up the east end of the dam, there is the foundation of a small building. Behind that is where the foundation of the lime house is. There is no way I am going to crawl through that with a video camera. Here are some stills from when it was more open. I believe the basement of the lime house was used to store and package the lime for sale, hence the two stairways on opposite sides of the basement, so they could come in with empty barrels and go out with product without interfering with each other. The upstairs with the fireplace would have been used to house the lime burners. The kiln had to be watched around the clock when burning so it didn't get too hot or too cold. During the 36 hours or more this took they would have stood shifts. They also had to stay there to load the kiln, unload it after it cooled for a day, and get things in shape for the next burn. It took 4 to 5 days for each burn. They probably did one a week when burning. Each burn used 8 to 10 cords of wood. About 200 feet to the northeast is a barn foundation. It was probably originally used to house the oxen used for hauling the rock and lime around, then repurposed for sheep, and finally cattle. I'm not going to fight my way over, as there isn't much to see, but we'll put up a still photo. We are back up where the brook from the spring enters the mill pond. There isn't much to see here now but this is where a more substantial stream once entered the mill pond from a ditch running to the west. A ditch bringing water from a remote source to a mill pond is called a leet. I believe animals being pastured here wiped out most traces of the leet at the east end. As we go west it begins to show up. If you notice the size of some of these trees along the leet, it will give you a sense of how old this place is. Most of the lead is filled in during the last 200 years or so, but this one section shows some of the original depth of it. Lucy and I are now approaching the Western Diversion Dam, where the stream that runs down from Slocum's Pond past the mill site was diverted into the Leet. More than half the dam was washed away long ago. Just upstream is a wall that marks the end of Lot 14. There is still one unsolved problem. Oh, there are plenty of rocks and boulders cluttering up Lot 14. Lime burners preferred freshly quarried limestone to weathered rocks as it produced a much better quality lime. The odd layout of lot number 14 suggests a long trail running north up the mountain was to enable the limestone to be quarried up there and hauled down to the kiln. I walked up this part several years ago and found no evidence of quarrying or hauling. The slope gets progressively steeper as you go up, and I would not want to come down it with a load of rocks behind me. Incidentally, you can see that lot number 14 is numbered number 5 on this map, but you can see it's an odd shape one, different from all the rest. However, at the time I climbed it, I followed the state forest line, the green line on this map, not realizing that after the stone wall marking the property line ended, the state forest line zigzagged west, while the original line went straight up. So I missed the upper part of lot number 14, which is now on private property. It doesn't seem like there was any quarrying there either because of the slope, but I am not certain. A short distance to the northeast along the ridge, there is a place marked as a marble quarry in the 1866 Bears Atlas map. Today it looks more like a natural feature than a quarry, but it probably was one. 
There are several problems with this site as the source of the limestone, though. It was on lot number 13 belonging to John Fenton and Stephen Ludington. The mountain seems too steep to haul rock directly down to the kiln. The only visible road seems to have led northeast away from the kiln, and they would have had to make a big circle around and come back to the kiln. This issue still needs to be solved. Well, we've reached the end of the video. Thank you very much for your patience in watching it. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something from it. I'd like to thank my wife for her patience in sitting around the house while I tramped through the woods or sat in front of the computer splicing audio and video segments. I'd like to thank Lucy the dog for accompanying me out in the woods. And I, I'm thankful for this opportunity to uh, try something new and put up a video instead of just a written summary of something or a book. If you have any comments, I'd be, be grateful if you'd put them down. It's nice to get some feedback from people. I mean, if you want to tell me I'm an idiot, I know, already know that, so you don't need to bother, but some constructive comments would certainly be welcome. And I hope to do another one of these soon on a different subject. Thank you very much, and goodbye.